Chapter 1 is fairly straightforward. I won't spend a lot of time reviewing it. You should spend some time familiarizing yourself with the terminology introduced in Chapter 1. We will be using many of these words throughout the year. There's a large list of regional terms that you should learn. These include things like the mental region, which refers to the chin, the brachial region, or the upper arm, and the antibrachial region for the lower arm. These are areas in the body. The relative directional terms refer to two parts in the body, describing how one is located relative to the other. For instance, ventral means that one thing is closer to the front than the other thing. But for the relative directional terms, there must always be two things. Last up are the sections. These go with the different types of medical imaging devices that we frequently see listed in Chapter 1 and represent pictures taken through the body or imaginary slices. The body cavities represent distinct chambers in the body that house one or more specific organs. These can be broken down into the dorsal and ventral body cavities. In the dorsal cavity we found the brain and spine while the ventral body cavity was a little bit more complicated. The diaphragm represents our first division between the upper or thoracic area and the lower abdominal pelvic area. In the thoracic area are two pleural cavities. Everything in between them is called the mediastinum, which is just stuff. But in there you can also find the pericardial cavity. Inferior to the diaphragm, we find the abdominal pelvic cavity, which can be further subdivided into the abdominal and pelvic cavities. Serous membranes can be found in all of the ventral body cavities. The parietal portion lines the body cavity, whereas the visceral portion touches the organs. The abdominal cavity was a little bit more complicated because here we call the serous membranes the peritoneum and in addition to the visceral and parietal peritoneum there were also mesenteries which didn't touch either the organs or the body cavity. And furthermore some of these mesenteries got specific names like the greater omentum and lesser omentum. Serous membranes produce serous fluid, which helps to lubricate these organs, which is important because they all move, and this helps to reduce friction when these organs move. This fluid can also provide a small amount of nutrients. Homeostasis isn't really a single thing. There are thousands of different homeostatic mechanisms in the body, each of which represent the body changing something just to stay the same. This usually involves the expenditure of energy. Nevertheless, out of all of these thousands of homeostatic mechanisms, there are some similarities that we must familiarize ourselves with. First off, we must be able to detect that something is changing. The book calls this a receptor, but I don't really care what we call it so much that the body is able to measure or detect the change in the first place. This information can then be sent to a control center. A control center is an organ that can control either itself or other organs. So we here need to control an effector, an organ that can change something in the body in a negative feedback mechanism, which is the most common form of homeostatic mechanisms, the effector does the exact opposite of what the receptor detected in the first place. There are a few examples of positive feedback mechanisms. We will be covering inflammation this term, which is one example. But pretty much all of the others will be negative feedback, where the body does the exact opposite of what was happening to it so that it can stay the same. 
This is an active process, which makes it different from equilibrium, which is a passive process that ultimately led to a new steady state, whereas homeostasis maintained the original steady state.